So they say dismiss children after announcements and prayer. Is there something downstairs? I'm not sure. One of the things that you find out when you become a parent, there's a lot of things you're going to learn when you become a parent. There's no book that teaches you everything you need to know when you become a parent. But you learn stuff on the fly. And one of the things that you pick up very, very quickly is that your children have a very keen sense of fairness. They will watch you like a hawk to make sure that you treat them all fairly, they treat them all the same. Everyone should get the same amount of attention. Everyone should get the same amount of candy or food or whatever else is shared in the house. And it doesn't stop when they're just small. It keeps going as they grow older. In our house, in our family, there was a certain age at which you could get an email address. And everyone was watching, and they knew what that age was, and it had to be fairly everyone as soon as they hit that age they could get an email address and uh, same with a cell phone there was an age when you get a cell phone and they all knew that and they were all watching because it has to be fair this idea of what is fair and right is ingrained in us as human beings even from birth God has given us all a conscience and that sense of injustice and unfairness can sometimes become overwhelming to us because that is something that we just cannot stand and we cannot handle when you think of the year 2020 it's going to go down in the history books as the year of COVID. but there are quite a few things that happened in this year and one of them is going to be this. I can't breathe. If you think back to 2020, where does that come from? George Floyd. A great wrong was committed when George Floyd was flat on the ground with a policeman kneeling on his neck. And George was trying to say, I can't breathe. At first they heard him say that, but later on his voice became lower and lower until eventually he wasn't able to say that anymore. Because of cell phones, someone videoed this and the whole world could see it and everyone was outraged at this big wrong it was committed to George Floyd and when that happened there was an expectation because of fairness because of our conscience because of justice there was an expectation that this would be met by condemnation and there would be punishment for the perpetrator but there was silence the great wrong was not met by condemnation. The great wrong was met by great silence. And so people took to the streets. Because inside each person is this idea that there should be justice. That that is the right thing to do. That is the way we want to live. And when they see that justice is not being given... They rise up. Not only do they rise up and ask for justice, but if it's not forthcoming at some point, someone is going to take justice into their own hands. Because a great wrong calls for a great retribution. Now, when we come to the story of David, as we've been reading in the book of Samuel, we see that David was forgiven by God for the sin that he has committed. His relationship with God was restored. But he still had to deal with the consequences 
of his actions. I've heard someone describe this as throwing a rock into a pond. When you throw the rock into the pond, the ripples start moving out. The, all the surface, all the water in the pond is affected by that rock that went in. Forgiveness is removing the rock from the pond again. Taking that rock back out of that pond. But the ripples will still keep moving. The consequences will still be felt. And we see this happen in the life of David. Nathan the prophet spoke to David in chapter 12. It was recorded. He says, Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore, there will be ripples. Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. The ripples in the life of David would mean that there would be more killing and this would happen in his family. The sword would never depart from his family. It's chilling. It's shocking. It should spur us on to make a determination in our own minds that we are going to keep ourselves from sinning. Because when we sin, there will be consequences. There will be ripples. Not just for us, but for everyone around us. Amen. We pick up the story of David here in 2 Samuel chapter 13. And what we find is that David has multiple sons by multiple wives. But our attention is drawn to two of those sons, Amnon and Absalom. Amnon is the firstborn, and he's going to be the crown prince. He's the one that's first in line to inherit the kingdom from David. Absalom is born from a, a kingly family. His grandfather is a king. His mother was a crown princess. And Absalom, we find, has designs himself on the throne of Israel. Absal Absalom and Amnon, the two sons. And we read here from verse 1 that Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. So the two sons, from two different mothers, the one son had a beautiful sister, and the other son loved that sister. And the scriptures tell us that she was beautiful. And there are only a handful of people described as beautiful in the scriptures, and she's one of them. It says, And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. He's stuck. He's in that catch-22 situation. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. So he had a cousin. His cousin, that says, was a very crafty man. Now that's not a good description, in case you get confused. To be called very crafty is not really good. And the cousin said to him, O oh, son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? What's going on with you? I look at your face, I look at your body, I can see something is wrong. Morning after morning, but what is it? Can you tell me? Come on, spill the beans. I need to know what's going on. 
Eventually, Amnon then tells him. He says, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, Let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. This is the plan. Go and pretend that you're ill. Your father David is going to come to see how you are. When he comes, ask him to send Tamar to you so that she can make the food with her own hand and then feed it to you. And in this way, you're going to get close to Tamar. What a crafty plan. It sounds like a bunch of middle schoolers, actually, to be honest. But this is the plan, and they go with that. So, Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And guess what? David comes. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight, and I may eat from her hand. What does David do? Does he see something is going on? No. David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, where he was lying down, and she took dough, and she kneaded it, she made cakes in his sight, and she baked the cakes. She took the pan, she gave it, emptied it out, but he refused to eat. Amnon said to her, Send out everyone from me. And so he sent everyone out from the house. Then he said to Tamar, Bring the food into the chamber that I, that I may eat from your hand. Tamar took the cakes that she had made, she brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. So you, this is PG-13, right? Uh, he grabs her. She doesn't know what's going on. She makes the cake. She thinks she's sick. She tries to help him. But he has some nefarious ideas. Grabs hold of her and says, Come, lie with me, my sister. What does she say to him? She answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outrageous thing. Now, that word outrageous is also translated wicked, evil. This is an evil thing. This is a wicked thing. As for me, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. She's giving him three reasons not to go ahead with this plan of his. First thing that she says, she says, this is very wrong. This is an outrageous thing in Israel. This is a wicked thing in Israel. Everyone knows that this is wrong. It's not just me thinking that or just my friend. Everyone knows how wicked this is. The conscience of all the people of the nation is against this. That's the first reason she gives him. The second reason she gives him, she says, where will I go to go get away from my shame? It will be on me. This is an honor and shame culture in the Middle East. Once you've been shamed like that, it will stay with you the rest of your life, your future will be forever tainted by what happened here. Think about that, Amnon. Think about my future. Think about the shame that's going to be on me the rest of my life. Don't only think about me, Amnon. Think about yourself. 
It's going to be on you. People in Israel are going to say, who is this wicked fool? The crown prince? The guy that's going to be king? Do we want him as king? The man who did this? She gives him three reasons not to do this. And then she gives him a way out. She opens the door for him to escape. She says, if you really love me, if you really want me, go, to sp go and speak to the king and ask for my hand. Ask him to marry me. He's going to let you do that. We know that he loves you, Amnon. He's going to let you do that. Why don't you go and do that? She gives him a way out. Three reasons not to do it and a way out. There is another way for you to get what you want. But despite her warning, he would not listen to her. And being stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. Doesn't want to listen. He goes through with it. Once he has done that, what he planned to do, his whole mindset changes. Instead of loving her or lusting after her, he now hates her. He changes like that, 180 degrees. It says he hated her with a very great hatred, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And then Amnon said to her, Get up, go. But once again, she pleads with him. She says, No, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. Now that, you're sent, now that you've done to me what you wanted to do to me, now that you're sending me away, this is even more wrong again than the first wrong that you did. Now, why does she say that? Well, in Deuteronomy, we saw that the law of the Israelites says that if a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver and he must marry the young woman for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. This is what's supposed to happen. He's already violated her, now he must marry her. And then he must remain married to her and he can never divorce her as long as he lives. This is what the law requires. This is the justice that needs to be done right here, right now. But he refuses to do this. He called the young man who served him and he said, Put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her. Throw her out and lock the door so she can't come back in. That is how Amnon is treating her. Now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. So his servant put her out, bolted the door after her, and Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore. And she laid her hand on her head and she went away crying aloud, as she went. She refuses to go silently. She tears her clothes, this beautiful robe that she had, the same word as, as used, it was used with Joseph, uh, Joseph's coat of many colors. She puts ash on her head, showing that she's in deep distress, and she cries aloud, so people will take note. This is not going to be swept under the rug. This is not just going to be something that happened on the side quietly. He has wronged her so deeply, not only by violating her, raping her, but also then by throwing her out and not doing what he's supposed to do. A great wrong has been committed. And she doesn't have the power to redress that, but she has the power to let people know. To make it known what has happened here. To bring it into the light. 
And she does that fearlessly. Her brother comes to her and he immediately guesses what happened. So he must have known something was going on. We read that her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon your brother been with you? Now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Tamar lived. A desolate woman. Before she was a beautiful woman. Now she's a desolate woman because of what he did in her brother Absalom's house. When David heard of all these things, he was very angry. And what do you expect to read next? Do you expect that King David now goes to Amnon's house? Do you expect King David to send soldiers to fetch him? Do you expect King David to take any action against Amnon? Of course you expect that. King David is the highest in the land. Justice should flow from him. King David should do what is right. But there's a great silence. The next we read, it, they say, But Absalom, her brother, spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon, because he had violated his sister Tamar. Absalom had in his mind to address this wrong. Absalom had in his mind that he was going to take justice into his own hands if King David wasn't going to do anything. Now you'll see there's a small a footnote there on verse 21. When King David heard of all these things, he was very angry, and there's a full stop. Or a period. But if you look at the footnote, it says the Dead Sea Scroll and a Septuagint add, but he would not punish his son Amnon because he loved him, since he was his firstborn. The Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, those were found beside, in a cave beside the Dead Sea in Israel. Those scrolls had texts going back many centuries. The Septuagint, which is the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, done about 200 years before Christ. Both of these ancient texts have in them this line, that David would not punish his son Amnon because he loved him since he was his firstborn. That makes sense to us. That explains the silence, it explains why no action is taken against Amnon. But what happens when a great wrong has been committed, followed by a great silence and no justice? It festers. Because people feel that this wrong needs to be addressed. This wrong needs to be made right. Two years go by, Nothing happens. But after two years, Absalom has a plan. Sheep shearers come to him. And he invites King David and his sons for a party. Because that's what you did. You had a party when the, sheeps, when the sheep were being shorn. King David says, we can't all go to your place. But Absalom insists that Amnon and some of the brothers should come. You see, he has a plan. Amnon goes, some of the other brothers go as well, and during the party, of course, there will be some drinking. Absalom says to his servants, keep an eye on Amnon. When you see him get drunk, that's the time to pounce. Then you go and you kill him, and I will take care of things. And so they do that. Amnon gets drunk. The servants come, they kill him, and all the other brothers flee for their lives. 
They get back to Jerusalem and they tell King David. And what does Absalom do? Well, he can't go back to Jerusalem now. So he flees to his grandfather, who is the king of Geshur. And that's where he hides out for three years. Now, what do we make of this? What do we make of this debacle that has taken place, this fiasco, this crazy thing that has happened in the family and the household of King David? All of Scripture is given to us so we can learn from that. Learn sometimes what to do and sometimes learn what not to do. And of course we see that the inaction by King David was an issue in this case. But it seems to me that the great wrong that was done to Tamar called out for justice. And when it was met by a great silence her brother Absalom took it upon himself to try and right that wrong. He took matters into his own hands. Now here's the thing. In this world, we have learned to live with injustice. The way sometimes that you've been treated by your family the way sometimes that you've been treated by some friends, the way that you've been treated at school or in the workplace or in your neighborhood, wherever you, we look in society, we see injustice. And I know that as we gather here today, each one of us can recount the times that we've been treated unfairly and wrongly. And sometimes even where a great wrong has been committed against us. And there was no justice. It was met by silence. You see, this grates on us, right? This affects us because we have the sense of fairness. We have the sense of justice. We have a conscience which has been with us since we were small children. When we see a wrong committed, we want to see it made right. We want to see justice. I'm going to leave three thoughts with you as we close. The first is that we need to lament when we don't see justice. Let's not just be quiet and sweep it under the rug. But let us lament. Let us cry. Sometimes cry out, other times cry in ourselves. But let us acknowledge the fact that a great wrong has been done. And that this is not the way that life should be. This is not the way that God has created this world to be. And this is not the way that God created mankind to be. Let us acknowledge that. And let us lament that. And in that lament... We will find our hope. Because, second point, there will be justice sometime in this life. It doesn't always happen as quickly as we want. They say the wheels of justice turn slowly, but they do turn. This is a psalm written by David, Psalm 7. It says, The wicked conceive evil, they are pregnant with trouble, and give birth to lies. They dig a deep pit to trap others, and then fall into it themselves. Have you seen this happen to people? Have you seen them try and set traps for others, and then they fall into it themselves? I've seen this. He says, the trouble they make for others backfires on them. The violence they plan falls on their own heads. 
I will thank the Lord because He is just. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. You see, the Lord is just, and the Lord sees everything that happens in this world. And many times, even in this life, He brings justice. And the evil and the wicked people find that they fall into the traps themselves. They find that their plans backfire on them even as they try to perpetrate it on others. Many times there is justice that happens in this life. But not always. And so the third point is this. Not only is there justice for many in this life, but there is justice after this life. Jesus, in John 5, says this. He says, don't be so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. There will be a resurrection from the dead. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I can do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Jesus Christ himself will be the judge. He says, I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. There will be justice in this life or after this life. But justice will be done by the judge of all the earth, Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that this morning. I want you to know that great wrongs are committed in this life. That sometimes those great wrongs are followed by great silence. But there will be justice because we have a just king and it will happen either in this life or after this life let us pray I'm going to ask the worship team to come up as we come before the Lord Father God we find ourselves many times either the victims of a great wrong or we find ourselves as witnesses of a great wrong happening to someone else and even at times we are the people creating and committing the great wrong I pray that you would forgive us when it's us I pray that you would cause us and call us to repentance I pray Lord that you would be gracious to the victims of a great wrong. I pray most of all, Lord, that you would encourage us, even as we lament of the injustice in this world, I pray that you would encourage us to know that you are the judge of all the earth and you will repay those who need to be repaid, either in this life or after this life. Please encourage us, Lord, with these words, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.